And then we'll still be looking a little bit into the gospel text that we want to bring into this conversation, particularly next week, but we'll see if we get there. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. I have Micah. All right, let's start with the Old Testament, and um, let's uh, have you read Micah. Let's do 6, uh, 1 through 8. How about that? Give us one through it. <clears throat> Sounds good. God, God challenges Israel. Hear what the Lord said. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and your endearing foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam's son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Simeth to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Amen. So the common mantra there in uh, verse 8, but a lot of times that context of going into that verse um, is, is often missed, and it's an important context of of really a courtroom setting where God is handing down uh, a verdict um, uh, uh, justice for what has been going on in the city of Jerusalem through the prophet from South Judah. So um, uh, we'll talk about the context there a little bit more, but let's move into Dr. King's letter tonight. Uh, as always, we'll do some reading, and then I'd like to hear your initial reaction, your thoughts. It could be about the uh, Micah text. It could be about Dr. King's letter or maybe putting those two in conversation, which is our ultimate goal, uh, and to think about um, today's context as well. So um, let's start with, we made it to paragraph five last time, so we'll move into paragraph six, which if you have it sectioned off, begins with a capital letter, and the first four words of this paragraph are in any nonviolent campaign. Uh, if you have a copy like mine, it kind of is leading into page two. Um, so if you have it with you, I'll give you time to find that. Yep, so the sixth paragraph. Paragraph six, almost page two on my documents. And it begins with in any nonviolent campaign. Does anybody have that and would like to start that off for us tonight? I do. Go ahead, Lynn. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. Negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notor notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, brutal, and unbelievable facts. 
On the basis of them, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. <laughs> this, All right, he'll take paragraph first two. First paragraph. Well, paragraph seven, actually. The next one, I'll, pick. I'll continue. Oh, go ahead. Me? Then last September came the opportunity to talk to leaders of Birmingham economic community. In the course of negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants. For example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs on the basis of these promises. <laughs> The Alabama Christian movement for human rights seeks a moratorium on all of these. As weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victim of a broken promise. A few times, three can be moved, returned, the others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted. And, 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 and the shadow of darkness on us. We had no alternative except to fair direct action, whereby we would present our very body as a means mm -hmm. of laying our case before the council and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we needed to undertake a process of self purification. We began a non violence and we repeatedly asked ourselves, Are you able to accept blows within without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Okay. I'll take, I'll take the next. Then it occurred to us that the March election was ahead, and so we speedily decided to postpone action until after election day. When we discovered that Mr. Connor was in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action so that the demonstration could not be used to cloud the issues. At this time, we agreed to begin our nonviolent witness the day after the runoff. This reveals that we did not move irresponsibly into direct action. We too wanted to see Mr. Connor defeated. So we went through postponement after postponement to aid in this community need. After this, we felt that direct action could be delayed no longer. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community has, that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dra dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism 
to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in the monologue rather than the dialogue. And who will take the <laughs> paragraph? Okay. One of the most basic points in the statement is that the action that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why did you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prided about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Bookwell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Bookwell is a much more gentle person than Mr. Connor, they are both dedicated to the maintenance of the status quo. I had hoped that Mr. Bookwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to this education. But he will not see this without pressure from the devotees of civil rights. My friend, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent crisis. Lamentably, it is historical fact that the privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral right and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold, Reinhold Lieber has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. And then I'll read this last paragraph and then we'll go into conversation. We know through painful experience that freedom is ne never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word, wait. It rings in the ear of every African American with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. Mm -hmm. It has been a tranquilizing thalamide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence and we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million African-American sisters and brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to children of color and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking an agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat people of color so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, 
when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name is the N-word and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and when your wife and mother are never given the respected title of Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are an African-American living constantly at tiptoe stance, never knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodyness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impact. I wonder why they found it necessary to edit the letter into more conforming language than the original. Um, I admit those edits were my own, actually. Um, I am not comfortable as a uh, white man of privilege to use the N word or to use the phrase for um, people of color that has the more negative connotation that I heard growing up. So I admit those edits were my own because- Okay. Yeah, it just, I'm not sure I feel that I should say that. I understand. Like because for example, in the speech that I have, which has been you know authenticated as original, they use the word Negro. Right. It was the word at the time. And, you know, I mean, it is, it, I am mean, into literature, the so words mean something. He thought of himself as a Negro. He didn't think of himself as an African American. American. At that yeah. time, that was a, a later uh, evolution of the term, you know. Yeah, part of my conviction is that things that um, might be appropriate for um, an African American to say, or yes. maybe even a woman to say, Yes. Um, I think mm -hmm. don't always mean that as a white male that I get to say it. <laughs> yes. I got you. Um, so yeah, that's my I, personal conviction there. I think especially with your accent, we know you're from the South. It happens to be that you're from Alabama. And so I think that heightened sensitivity is very appropriate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's go around. What are your initial thoughts? Those are, that was a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot there um and then of course the text of micah um so uh let's go around what are your initial thoughts there how much is still the same it's just what i was gonna say jerry yeah it's, it's all there it? i know and you hear especially people what we see what's happening today yes exactly you and know, why the people are yeah. protesting in everything that I read in here is still there. Yeah. And the and, understanding oh. of why people can't wait any longer. Yeah. I mean, now we're over 400 years. How long are people supposed to wait for justice? It's enlightening to me uh, yeah. to see what the protests yeah. that are going on and the changes that are happening in several states with the law. Yes. I would get in trouble for teaching this, but because, you know, I know things. This is not new. In 1693, Samuel Sewell, who was a judge at the Salem with witchcraft trials with John Winthrop, who was also the governor of Massachusetts and the presiding judge of the Salem witchcraft trials, who both renounced their decision to hang witches. But Samuel Sewell wrote a book and it was against white slavery, 340 years. And the book was entitled On the Selling of Joseph. Now that's a book by a Puritan writer acknowledging the sin of black slavery. Now you move forward 340 years in 1951 and 52, my parents brought 
my brother and I down to Florida, which was a cracker state at that time. And, you know, I remember two years later, my seventh grade teacher used the word nigra and she was thought of as a liberal. Okay, because she was yeah. so that's 340 years of linguistic abuse. Mm. And I think that the problem is that there's a there's not a cultural consensus to integrate. So he's saying let's integrate, and the culture doesn't want to integrate. Let's take today for an example, and I'll sign off on this round. But the Supreme Court has just ruled that being gay is not sufficient cause to be fired. Now, in 1948 to 1960, when I was attending Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, you couldn't be gay and be a minister. You couldn't be a woman and be a minister. And so we, you know, there is, there are sometimes irreconcilable differences that can't be mitigated. But I bet you, if you switch the question to most American men, you know, what, I know you're against abortion, you know, but would you keep a gay child alive if you, that child was born to you? And I would argue that a lot of men probably would feel very uncomfortable with that question, as is the issue of my, uh, three of my nephews, you've met them. Okay, they're 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 in biracial marriages. You know? Two two are with uh, Asian girls, and one is an Inca. And you know, in our family, we're rather proud of that. But we do understand that a lot of the country doesn't like that. You know, there's a uh, well, and not too long ago, that wouldn't have been legal. Um, oh right, yes. You know, um, you know, we just celebrated celebrated if that's the right word. But Loving Day, which is the day that like interracial marriage became okay, you know, became not legal. And I, I know I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but in the letter, he talks about just laws versus unjust laws. Yes. And just because something is legal doesn't right. make it right. No. Or sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just because something is legal doesn't make it right. Like, um, you know, just slavery at one time was legal. Um, you know, LGBT people were once called legally mentally ill. Yeah. But just because something is lawful, that's what I mean, lawful. Something is lawful, it doesn't make it right. And, you know, we're talking all about this, um, uh, you know, rioting or looting or whatever you want to call it. Technically, that's illegal right now. And I might be going too far. But just because something's illegal, also what he's saying then, doesn't make it wrong. Yeah. You know? I don't know. Well, that's why we're getting a lot of sermons on the internet on Romans 13. There's, you know, I mean, I think it's not a coincidence. Romans 13, there are unjust governments and unjust laws. And we think, oh, it's racial discrimination, but it may be miscegenation, given the, the persuasions of the ministers that are talking about it. You know, you know. I, like, I like what he says about the idea that he doesn't want violence. And certainly what concerns him are the moderate whites. Yes. The ones who want law and order above a broken window. Right. But where, you know, the frustration boils over like a tea kettle. How yeah. long can you have your feet to the fire and yeah. not act out? I find, the I find the restraint of the marchers amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. and he even says that about his own time when he says these are the real heroes. Yeah. yeah. You know, not the police that aren't beating us in front of other people. And, yeah. I, and there are very good police, but we have to look at the situation. And it was funny for me when I was watching television, watching the news last night, and I saw the man who had fallen asleep at the drive through mm. um, and then what ensued from that. And initially, when I watched it, I said, well, he did steal the stun, the stun gun. He did turn the stun gun onto the cop. Was there any justification here? But what I later felt through reading, praying, was remember, the cop has to feel as though his life is in imminent danger. His life was not in imminent danger. But the thing is, I think that's how we train our police. 
shoot yeah. to kill. And if somebody's aiming anything at you, you're in imminent danger. So how do we work together to change that justice system? Yeah. You know, a lot of times with the stands I have, I have people who say, well, you just hate cops, you know. But no. actually, I feel sorry for people who oh. have that job. They're underpaid. Yes. They're putting their lives on the line mm -hmm. for a system that's incredibly corrupt. Undereducated. They're undereducated. We don't require the diversity training that they should get. Right. In my opinion, everybody who's a police officer has a college degree. And we should pay them a, a ton lot more. And mm -hmm. I think there's major reform needed higher up. So if anything, my pressure is not on, on crucifying police folks, but mm -hmm. challenging the system that has racist practices in the training itself. Sure. Uh, that's what we need to target. Um, it's not about hating police folks who put no. their lives on the line for us. It's mm -hmm. about challenging a system that that leads them to believe that people of color are a threat for jogging down the road or being in a park. Right. 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 This gets okay. even more tragic. Karen, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, Karen and uh, Paul, I want to hear from you before we move to the next question. Uh, I, I was going to say as I listen, um, he, he, in so many words, what he's talking about is they're not even respected as human And as I read, knowing a little bit more history than what's in the list, they even point out the worst cases. Emmett Till, the lynch. And in a sense, some of the shootings and killings that we see. I mean, literally, they're not lynching, but it's the same result. And to me, I, I don't disagree that we need to our law enforcement better. I pray for you, Michael. Um, but I think it's something more basic. We have to start instilling our young, and some of them, some of them are, but we have to start instilling more respecting people to who they are. It's going to say, it's not just our young, we have to, I'm just not sure you can teach all the old dogs new tricks. But I, 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 I see as a, a key point in changing this, beyond the training and all this stuff, it's just, it's just, it's just, we have to do as a society a much better job of respect for people simply because they're people. Go back to the words of the Declaration of All Men Are Created Equal. I would like that would be written in 2020 rather than 1770. It would say all human beings are created. Mindset was there. And I mean, that actually. Amen. Thank you so much. One part I, I noticed was, you know, you know, we're saying the words police brutality, going back to the first thing uh, Jerry and Lynn noticed. I mean, as I'm saying police brutality from a letter written uh, 50 years ago, over 50 years ago, um, I admit there's a feeling of, uh, there can be a feeling of hopelessness and it can for a moment just freeze you in this work. To, to realize how long we are at it. But if I've, I've, learned, if I've learned anything from prophetic voices, preachers, uh, and the Bible, the biblical prophets, it's that the arc of justice is long. And if we want to do this work, we got to be in it for the long game, which means we can't be as reactionary. We can't let our emotions become what it's about. You know, I think that's one of the biggest uh, can be one of the biggest issues with white folks doing justice work is we get so focused on how we're feeling emotionally that we can't move. And so we, we don't know what to do. We feel hopeless. We get overwhelmed. And then we're not emotionally able to keep doing the work. Yeah. Um, so I think we have to be very careful about not making the issue 
about, because sometimes I, I think as white folks, we get more upset about the idea that we could be a white supremacist or we could be a racist than actually white supremacy. Like white supremacy should make us more upset than the idea that we might have some deep inside us. Yeah. But sometimes I think we're more worried about our personal reputation. That alarms us more than a man being murdered in the streets because of his color of his skin. Yeah, I think it's because people think of racism and think of think turn it into racist. Um, but they turn that we turn it personal when in fact it's not a personal thing. It has nothing to do with me, Caitlin, at all, and everything to just do with the skin color that I was born into and the privileges that that skin color has gotten me so far. But it's not a personal thing, and so that's why personally. Um, you know, I try to, you know, if it's a personal thing then I shouldn't feel guilt about it, but I should do something about it. You know, I shouldn't feel guilty because of the things that, like we were talking about Paul last week. I shouldn't feel guilty because of the doors that have been opened for me, but I should do something to right. open the doors alongside of me right. because of what that is, you know? Yeah. You know, I'll see these reactions on Facebook. Oh, well, oh, that person don't have a racist bone in their body, you know? It's not about, you don't have to have a racist bone in your body for racism to benefit you. Right. You know, it's not about accusing our, each other. It's about and, you know, recognizing privilege. You know, Martin Luther King had a choice. He was very well educated. He could have gotten a chair in philosophy or theology at probably any seminary, um, but he chose to stay and to lend his voice. And I think that's exactly what you're saying, that if you do have privilege, you have to lend your voice. Right, yeah. Amen. And I think I think it's interesting, you know, we, we think of these protests as emotional responses or knee jerk responses, mm -hmm. but this letter, I mean, it's just a primer for all of us on how to do justice. I mean, Martin yeah. Luther King gave us such a gift in this letter literally laying out piece by piece when he he could have been very defensive and been like you don't understand what i'm doing well you know mm -hmm. said, he could have said a curse word right then but no he <laughs> explains the background of what he did and or well, what the groups that he was a part of did why they did it how it got to this point you know i mean you see these four steps collection of facts then negotiation then self-purification then direct action and yes. we think direct action, direct action meaning protests and all those sit-ins that, that he did, we thought that was the first step. But like as white people, because we didn't see the other three steps, we're like, oh, what an emotional knee-jerk reaction to be marching, you know, in the streets. But really there were these three pre-steps that like, to him, he's like, listen, we tried negotiation. You think we didn't try that before we put our kids on the line in front of these giant fire hoses? You think we didn't try to ask for, you know, these rights before we went and sat in jail? You think we didn't try that? Like, you think we're that dumb is basically what, what I, what mm -hmm. I think, he, you know, he's being much more kind, like I said, than I, than, I, than I would be. But I think that's what he's saying is, you know, we tried all of that. This isn't an emotional reaction or a, a knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. This is planned and intentional um, and that might hurt for you all to see, you know, our kids, and it certainly hurts for them, but um, they realized that that was all that America would wake up to was if a kid was getting brutalized by fire hydrants, you know, and, and, and I think that's kind of, I mean, again, parallels today, I think it took a lot of people until Sandy Hook to recognize like gun control issues, um, which I don't want to jump off of um, racial, right. but it, it takes kids, you know, seeing innocent kids to do that. And they knew that back then, those things were intentional. Um, and so it was obviously yeah. something so important to them. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's so important to remember that historically protests in this movement started with the church service. They met in church, they mm -hmm. prayed, mm -hmm. and then they headed to that bridge in Selma. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think as a or church- Or sometimes they didn't, like if they didn't feel right, like, like remember, right, yeah. There, we went to we went to Selma for the 50th anniversary, and they said like two weeks earlier they had met and they had prepared to do that march, and something told them not to go, and so they didn't. Remember, mm -hmm. uh, they they were truly guided by the Holy Spirit, um, and and grounded mm -hmm. in worship. 
um, in a way that um, is just beautiful. Um, but yeah, and which is very prophetic to go back to Micah and and the prophets, you know, to be to have that at your center. And I think it also addresses us not running dry, filling the well, going to the well over and over again to be fed by the word of God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that God works through us rather than us thinking we're in charge and we're doing it alone. Yeah. Amen. I have a story to share. I've shared it with Micah, the destroyer story. I uh, During Vietnam, I got drafted, but I'm... They thought I had them fooled. I was pretty smart. And at 19, they made me a navigator of a nuclear destroyer called the USS Carpenter. And one of the sister ships that I worked with was called another nuclear destroyer, the USS Sproston, which is one of the two ships that were involved in the Gulf of Tonkin resolution mm -hmm. with the Frank mm -hmm. Knox. That's enough Navy history. Some number one, there is no such thing as race, okay? There, you, you know, we all have melanin in the skin. It's the same melanin. And aside from some hair features, I could use more, and, uh, you know, facial features, there's no difference. If I need a liver, I can get a cross type and match from anybody from any so-called race. So part of what the human race has got to understand is that there is no such thing as race as there is no such thing as a, the, science has not found a gay gene either. So, you know, if the science is wrong, it's harder to fix. In any case, back to the destroyer. So, God, it was terrible. I could get sleep for two years as we put two or three million miles on the Pacific. Anything, I know the Pacific like the back of my hand. And uh, we were patrolling I almost was getting at, we were patrolling between Midway, you've heard of the Battle of Midway, and yes. Pearl Harbor. That's what we were doing at the end of my service. And we were looking for Russian submarines to pop them off, and they were looking for us. It was called patrolling, you know, you're trying to defend the Pacific space. And we're still doing that, in, even in the same places. So if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see me in uniform holding going over the equator saying, uh, I'm looking for Chloe and this is a whale watch. Okay, so in any case, we're patrolling on a US military ship, flying the American flag, ostensibly in combat. Okay, that's the purpose. American ship, flag, missiles, combat. We had uh, 10, semi-professional black people like I was. I was a semi-professional navigator. They call us a quartermaster. That doesn't mean we give out shoes. It means we navigate the ship quartermaster. And uh, these guys ran the radar room. I mean, you know, they were smart people, smart people in the radar room, multicultural crew. And uh, we're going between Midway, you know, the Battle of Midway and Pearl Harbor. There was something there too, I think, in World War II. Pearl Harbor became a metaphor for something, I think, an alien attack. Well, over the loudspeaker came the announcement from the captain that Martin Luther King was shot. Mm -hmm. Both crews yelled applause. This was in 1968, five years after the Birmingham speech. Mm. Three years after the Civil Rights Act on a U, you know, I maybe I'm just impressed with the flag and the destroyer. And, but this was an official action of war that we were on. There were black crew members. And yet. Racism thrived. I mean, mm. theoretically, the law could court martial all those sailors. And then I don't know how the Navy would have gotten the ships back. Mm. But, you know, it, part of law and liberty is morality and we have not, Dr. King made a very strong case for the morality of, it. but part of our job is as Christians is to say, well, there is no morality of this. There is no such thing as race. You know, most uh, people who are in the professions will tell you that now. And uh, 
you know, we have to sort of hammer this out. Now we can do it the old way, and I'm being ironic here, the uh, Anglo-Saxons were displaced for a while by the Danes, the Danes by the Anglo-Saxons. There were tribal wars all over Europe 500 years ago. But I, you know, I hope we're not seeing that here. With uh, like well, I appreciate you making that point because it just shows, as we were talking about earlier this week, I forget who I was speaking with, but, you know, with law change, as we see looking 50 years forward now, uh, it doesn't mean heart change. And I was looking at the second paragraph we read today where he talked about they, the, the people said, OK, we're going to change all the signs. We're going to take all the signs that say white people only. And then they didn't follow through. And I can't help but thinking about all the commercialism that's taking place right now with Black Lives Matter. Yeah. NASCAR is saying we're not going to have any more Confederate flags, which I went to Talladega uh, 10 years ago, we handed out water bottles and, uh, you know, just tried to minister to the people there um, who were kind of stumbling out of their trailers. And we actually had a little church service there and offered prayer if anybody wanted it. And we handed out water bottles. Wow. And um, I'm here to tell you the Confederate flag wasn't just a, a every other vehicle flag. It was the, it was the I mean, might as well be the NASCAR. It was logo. the trademark yeah, yeah. of NASCAR. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see if this will actually be something that NASCAR, you know, they say it now in an emotional moment when the pressure is on. Mm -hmm. um, but will they actually enforce that? Yeah. Will they actually live that out? And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, that the heart change is what's going to happen. It can't just be a, uh, you know, a corporate uh, gimmick. And that's a hard thing to do. If I tell this story without the destroyers, many people in Buffalo think I'm committing heresy. You know, the fact that we're all of the same race. In fact, my grandmother was a treasurer of the Gideons in Florida. And, you know, she got me dunked when I was eight. So I got dunked. No choice. Revival meeting. And I brought up the indelicate question does that mean the guy who's working for Gramps in his business is my brother? And my God, what a flurry. I mean, here we are in practically antebellum Orlando in a Baptist camp. And, you know, like, oh, no, 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 it doesn't count there. And, you know, these are, I remember these as godly people, but I don't want to call it denial. But certainly I don't see uh an easy solution because it's yeah very i mean with 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 race you know it is important to remember i think that race is a construct that yeah. it, you know but i think the way forward is probably not to use that to um try to start the conversation because yes race is a construct but the abuses that came with that construct yeah. Right. are very much real and still being lived out. So yes, race is a construct, but it's kind of like the moment for us to say, okay, we're all equal. Like that ship has sailed. There's inequalities that we have to deal with before we can say, okay, we're all the human race. Right. It'd be kind of like if I, you know, cut your legs off and crippled you and then said, oh, I'm sorry. Now we can be just live fairly together and I have legs and you don't. And I'm like, okay, everything's fair now. It's not true, but it's it's not true, but it's real. Right, it's not it true, real. but it's, it's real. real. Yeah. yeah, which are it's just a very interesting uh, uh, just place. But something I wanted to bring up, just because I this is my own curiosity, my own question. I'm going off of Mega's questions. There's um there was a point where he said um, groups are more immoral than individuals. Yes. Which oh my god, isn't gosh, that, that true? Isn't that that just, true? Like, which is the exact opposite of what you would, well, what I think we're called to be, right? Yeah. Like I would think, you know, the more people are at a table, if somebody said something that was out of line, then the group would hold them accountable, you know, to say like, oh, you shouldn't say that, or oh, you shouldn't believe that, or whatever it is. But isn't that the exact opposite of how it normally is? My, the example that I had was, um, I was in a sorority in college, a social sorority, um, which I loved my time there. I had some great leadership stuff. They had all their issues. Anyway, 
but there was a certain fraternity on our campus um, who we always said, if you knew them one-on-one, -on -one, like I was their lab, one of them was my lab partners. I was tutoring for a bunch of them because they were part of the football team. They had the tenderest hearts. I mean, were some of the sweetest guys I knew, but when they were together as a group, they were, they were absolute hell. I mean, it was like racism, sexism, homophobia, all the things that you could be, all of the worst parts of humanity came out when they were together. And I just, I don't know, this is my question, is like, why? Why is that true? Why is it true that groups are more immoral than I think I think because you can be anonymous. Think about Charlottesville, not that long ago. The sight of neo-Nazis walking down the street carrying tiki torches, it was unbearable. And I was preaching the following day at Orchard Park. Wow. And I just threw away what I planned to say. And we just spoke about that. And one woman came up to me and we were talking about it. And she said, I never thought this would happen in America. I'm from Germany. Yeah. And she spoke about Hitler and she was a child when Hitler came to power, but she was old enough to remember. And I said, it's not going to happen here because we're going to stand up to it. But you can lose yourself in a crowd and be carried away on your basis instinct. Um, but one other thing I wanted to mention, this is making me think of a local organization we have here, the National Federation, uh, no, it used to be called the National Federation of Christians and Jews. Yeah. But now it's called, um, oh, I'm blanking on it. Lana Benetovich heads it up. Um, and it's for just communities and they do education programs might be something we could look into for the presbytery yeah. uh, locally. They help you identify your own racism and they help you work through it, not in a condemning way or you right. should know better, but in a self-discovery way what that I think can really lead uh, it to, uh, to and change, you know, Amen. Oh, yeah. I know what it is. National Federation of Just Communities. National, National Federation, Federation of, of, Just, of Communities. Just Communities. Yeah, Lana Benetovich is the executive director. Yeah, we have to recognize that it's deep tissue work. If we really want to be an ally to, to our sisters and brothers experiencing disproportionate uh, mistreatment and abuse, we have to get into our own subconscious cultural biases going back to childhood um there's studies now that say at three months year old three months old three months old uh children are making racial um um decisions yeah they, so at three months old babies uh they hooked babies brains up to um you know charts to see what they react to so if, if they prefer that something, hey, Kim, uh, if, they, if they prefer that picture, then a certain part of their brain will light up. If they don't prefer that, then another part of their brain would pop up. Anyway, um, and at three months old already, babies will prefer, meaning like part of their brain, the, the, the excited part of their brain will start sparking on the race in which they see the most, meaning their caregivers. So whoever is their caregiver or who they see the most, whether that be uh, a mom, dad, nanny, whoever mm. it is, they, they start to associate that if this is, again, if it's a healthy relationship, if, the, if that caregiver is like giving good you know, attention and that kind of thing, not obviously abusive situations, but they will start associating that with good, um, meaning like good, caring, you know, all these good things, mm -hmm. that, all those words that we associate with that. Mm. So that's why it's even so important from literally as young as three months old to have diverse friends, diverse families, mm -hmm. diverse churches, diverse yeah. people holding that baby. Because it's actually not about themselves because they haven't recognized what color they themselves are. Like when it's like when you put a mirror in front of a baby, they don't recognize that that's them. They think that's another baby, right? <laughs> um, so they, but they they start seeing things, whatever they're seeing, they are, are already negotiating good, bad, caring. You should be a Christian ed educator. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've studied brain development or something. Yeah. Uh, let's go quickly to the next question. I want to hear from each of you on this question. 
Uh, it's number two in uh, our study questions we emailed, uh, and we have attached to the comments or no? no we don't. Um, what can we learn from this letter, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, Kim? I know you've arrived here. Uh, we're looking at that letter today yes. in connection with uh, Micah chapter six. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what can we learn from this letter and those who received this letter? What can we learn from the folks who received this letter? And what can we learn from the letter itself? So um, I'll turn it over to uh, Paul and Karen. What are what are, what can we take away from now that we've read almost a pretty good portion of the letter as a group? What do you think some of the takeaways from this letter as we look at it historically and those who received it? First one, that's the writing. So I don't know I'm sorry, um, Paul, you I'm broke up. Rock the boat a little bit. Oh, I, I can barely I, I, hear you. I'm going to rock the boat a little bit. It's something I was, uh, as we talked last week, and it's, the thoughts come back, and it's, it's building a little bit on what Jerry said with the National Federation is becoming public and on ourselves. They say the most segregated hour of the week is that hour on Sunday morning, whether it's from 9 to 10 mm -hmm. or 10 to 11 or 11 to 12 doesn't matter. And I wouldn't want to rush into this. I would want it to be as, as well thought out as it could so that it could be successful. But I'd like at some point for us to explore, and I, I don't mean this group, I mean as a congregation, and maybe it's a joint congregation because we have this lobby at Westminster of being in a, I'm going to use the word genuine relationship with a minority church. Um, one of the ways I think, you know, going back to developing respect and all that, one of the ways you can do is, is I think there are also studies that say the more you get to know people, hmm. yeah. the less activity there is. It, 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 in a way, this is my words, not, uh, but the more you get to know people and walk in their shoes, the more you understand who they are and that while we all have differences, there is a lot of similarity. And and I'd love to see us find some way, and it could start small, but to start to build some kind of genuine relationship with another congregation. Um, it's kind of along the lines, uh, Caitlin, maybe you know more about than I do. I think Westminster still has a very good connection with uh, one of the synagogues. There's a synagogue right down the street where the two communities worship together once or twice a year and they have a day where they go out and they do projects around town yes. together. That's I think it's called yeah. or something like that. Um, it would be something, you know, to start something like that. Mm -hmm. I can't, 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 can't. You're right on, Paul. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. Relationship is transformative. I think back yes. to when my students in Birmingham, Alabama, before I became a Presbyterian minister, uh, came out to me that that began the heart change about LGBTQ folks. Um, it was those relationships with those kids where they felt safe in the Peace USA church uh, and loved. And seeing the way that affected them begin a heart change in me about that issue. Uh, relationship mm -hmm. does it. Relationship. Uh, Lynn, let's uh, turn it over to you. Hey. Oh. <clears throat> Am I up or who else is up? I was going to see if Lynn wanted to address that question. Yeah. Uh, what can we learn from this letter and those who received it? Well, what I learned from this letter is the way he referred to the biblical text in the beginning mm -hmm. yeah. and as a basis for the whole letter. I found that um, actually comforting that it went directly back to the word. Um, where do we go from here? I also see it 
relating, as I said before, very much to what's happening on our streets today. And looking at the protests, protests as an action to what the word is calling us to do. Mm. As far as it's nonviolence, mm. the belief of the people that are protesting, it's wonderful to see some of the things I've seen around the country and around the world that have been very peaceful. Yes. Um, I'm thinking now even of the sit-in down at City Hall by the uh, Black group that was protesting the um, Black woman that, that had lost her job. And I think they were all protesting the woman that was put in jail after hitting the uh, policeman on Bailey Avenue. Yeah. And that they were all very peaceful. Yeah, I, I also that. liked what I think too was very good with the people in our country is the fence that was put up at the White House and all of the signs that are now decorating that fence so that it really is a fence of peace and a fence of belief of the people. And I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this letter is saying exactly that. I liked the four steps that he gave us yes. and how we should do it. We don't just run out and do it. We start with the facts. That sounds like Andrew Cuomo giving his daily update. The facts, <laughs> start with the facts. Star this is not facts. opinion, these are the facts. <laughs> and look at what, New and then too, look at what has New York State yes. has done as far as lowering that curve as compared to the rest of the country. So it'll be in interesting here to see what happens as uh, the country loosens up or the state loosens up, so. We'll Amen. I mean, I saw a sign that said, when George Floyd called for his mother, he summoned all mothers. Oh, that's he very powerful. Mothers. I so think we can look at protests as a prophetic call to action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, just like we listened to the prophet Micah, if instead of condemning protests, we would listen and look at it as a call to action mm -hmm. to, to respond with compassion and empathy. And, and as you said, Leah, not just, not just act, but, but think about what we're going to do and be intentional. Uh, that's a huge part of, the, of this work. If I weren't so incapacitated in my mobility, I would be marching with them. Oh, yeah. Well, I know you would, sister. I've been waiting 50 years for this, and I can't join it because I can't walk. You know, I, you know, was, I was there. almost thinking of dragging my scooter down there. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you you go, if you go, call me. I'll, I'll get you down there and get a sign. I can't yeah. lift the scooter. <laughs> Someone would have to do this for me. <laughs> I get it. I'll get you. You let me know. All you right. Have extra, uh, I have a scooter and two more here. So oh, yeah. Dr. Martin more. hooked me up <laughs> yeah. when I had my foot. Well, you, you both can come. Unfortunately, I'm scooter. afraid to go into crowds right now. I yeah. know. It's, yeah, it, that's something, you know, you got to balance. And it's, it's, uh, you're, you know, we went down for two different things. And we, we ended up actually handing out water for one because they went right past Westminster Presbyterian Church. So we decided to hand out water instead of marching. Um, yeah. And, um, but it's so scary, you know, because not everyone's wearing their masks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's it's a lot to try it's and balance. Safe, you know. It's yeah. definitely not safe. Well, I see Karen's got her hand up. Oh, Karen's got oh, her hand up. She raised her oh, hand like, right? we're, like we're in school. All right, we'll go to Karen and then Dr. Martin. Well, <laughs> Most like. Oh, see the picture in the last several days on one of the local news websites of the nuns, I think, at one order, sitting outside their mother house in lawn chairs with their throat on the side. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that, Paul. I said there was a picture on, I don't know if it was on the WCR website, WIED, of a couple of local Catholic nuns. I don't remember what order who wanted to be part of the protest, but you know, they're older. So they're sitting in their lawn chairs out on the lawn of the mother house holding their protest sign. As people <laughs> okay. walk by. 
I love it. You said that was them. I, I, I want to be sarcastic and cynical for a minute. I find it very ironic, forget my political statement, that the great wall builder who wants to build a wall to keep people out, the first wall he was really successful in building was the wall to keep himself in the White House. Isn't that oh. true? I see that as ironic. Oh, you're going to get us in trouble now. <laughs> No, no, you don't have to agree with me. I'm just, you know, you can point. To I agree with thing. you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a genius, Paul. All right, Dr. Martin. Uh, <laughs> great. That okay. was great. That was great. Yeah, Dr. Martin, uh, that question, what can we learn from this letter? And uh, oh, okay, okay, well, I'll try and keep it short. That's going to be difficult for me. So just go <laughs> like this and I'll quit. Uh, the audience for Micah is still separate 12 tribes and they have tribal wars they're you know they're not good to enemies uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah they circumcised the, the former husband of Jewish wives and then they killed him I mean you know so that was not truly a liberated society particularly but Micah who has seen the seedy side of life I believe it's Micah uh, appeals to a sentiment of how uh, the Hebrew people felt about each other. So they understood the captivity narrative. They understood the exit strategy, even though they got the facts wrong. I mean, we now know that they didn't leave Egypt. They left Babylon. And, you know, but there's a spiritual truth to that. So he takes that spiritual truth and he puts it all together and he has an ideal for those people. I don't think he might have felt the same. Well, he may have felt neutral about Cyrus and the bird, but he may not have felt that way. I think everybody understands what I'm saying here, that he was speaking to a group of people who shared basic assumptions about who they were. Even if they got the facts wrong, they got the sentiment right in terms of imagery, typology, metaphor and deep structure. They invented a world that changed and turned upside down. There are what, 2 billion Christians? I mean, I can't get 30 people for a Puritan court. <laughs> so, you know, like this is, this is a magnificent thing. And everyone goes, well, it's not true, it's not true. And I certainly know them with Paul Kurtz and the humanists. But I go, yeah, but what is going on? And what's going on is what Werner Herzog calls a, a plasticity. There's something in the gospel and the Old Testament that appeals to all of us. It found something. And then there's a, a permeability that goes back not to the Jews. I, I sound like a heretic. Here. It goes back 50,000 years to the caves of Lascaux and Corvaux, whatever it is, where people would meditate in a cave and relate to animals like you know and have these fertility things those people were very spiritual probably just as spiritual as we are without language okay so there's this feeling of identification with a larger group and uh you know don't make fun of them they're our brothers and sisters you know that kind of thing now i saw this in england with the english and the irish they hate each other. I mean, this is a war that's been going on since William Wallace. Okay, they despise each other. And when I was at Oxford and Cambridge, I made friends with a lot of English people who later came to visit me on the West Side. And somehow or other, they were amazed that we had so many pizza places on the West Side, because in England, if you have a pizza parlor in your neighborhood, that's a she-she neighborhood. It's like having a co-op. So, uh, you know, uh, I had two friends, uh, Dave Thresh, who introduced me to the Archbishop of Canterbury because he sang in his choir as a kid, uh, he and his brother, and then Mark Alvin, who was from uh, Parkside. And uh, I don't know, David said to me, he says, what is this thing in America with the Hispanics, James, you're Hispanic. In England, Going to Spain is the hot thing to do. You know, the Spaniards are the sharp people in Europe right now. 
This is back in 1980. And I said, well, the uh, Hispanics have the same problem you do with the Irish. And it didn't sink in. He said, what do you mean, we Irish? He says, uh, you know, they're dirty, they're uneducated, they breed. And I said, you could say that about Queen Victoria. I mean, you know, uh, she was the breeder of warlike kings created World War I. But this was so ingrained that there was hate toward the Irish. Mm. And, you know, I used to belong to the Buffalo Athletic Club and Sheriff Higgins was there and uh, we kind of got along. So he told me that when he was growing up in South Buffalo, he loathed the English. And many of him and his friends as children rooted for the Germans to beat the Irish. And of course, and if you look at World War II history, the great fear of the English was that the Irish would act as a corridor for the Germans to come in and do a different kind of battle of Britain. So there is racial and cultural hate, but mm. the mantra is the same. It's the dehumanization of the person you hate. Mm -hmm. So trying to, I think Micah is addressing that in a different context. So how do you yeah, address well, that? Well, it, in the United States, we've tried to address that with schools. And I worked at a school, uh, performing arts, and its only purpose is not to create art or to create artists. Its only purpose is to get white kids from the city of Buffalo to sit next to black kids in the city of Buffalo and have them tolerate each other as they share a learning experience called art. And, you know, so they dragged me in to do my song and dance entertainment and you know, it, it works, it works. It's very expensive <clears throat> and it doesn't work overnight. So, uh, and also uh, I don't think most of the parents and the students understand the purpose for the school, which is integration, not mm -hmm. art. Now I know I have a degree in art and the kids are great artists. Sure. And you know, I, I buy into the fantasy. That's why we had such high scores. Well, you know, I accept them, but you have yeah. to do that. And it yeah. takes generations to do that. Not one, not just me. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of pieces to this work and education is a big piece. And another piece you mentioned there, Dr. Martin, is purpose. If we do something, but without intentionality and we forget, you know, the why, that can, that can be very disruptive. And that was a, a lot there. But one thing I wanted to say to your Micah, to your brilliant Micah, interpretation there is there's a saying about that you know it, the bible's not a history book no. but it doesn't mean it's not true that's right <laughs> because that's of right. the meaning that comes from those things i mean like yeah. i think the prophet micah can only be really credited for the first three chapters of micah so the famous verse micah 6 8 <laughs> uh may or may not actually come from the prophet micah but well, it came from the community yeah. that were influenced yeah. by the prophetic word. So. Well, I'll share you know, my background and you may throw me out now, but you know, I, uh, I was a smart kid in New York and I got in the Navy, got a smart rating. And because of the war, I was, I hated the war. I came back mad at God because how dare he put me in the Vietnam War against my will. I didn't want to go. And it probably even annoyed me that I was successful at, yeah. you know, like not only do I not like this, but I'm good at it. And uh, so. Well, thank you for sharing from your experiences. And let's go to Reverend Jerry. I apologize. Yeah. I know we're a little bit over. Oh, that's let's okay. Go to Re Just Reverend one, Jerry, and then we'll hear I'm from sorry, one, I didn't mean to cut into your time. Oh, no, uh, thank you for your uh, one, one fast thing. When I read Micah, I'm sorry, when I read Martin Luther King's letter, I realize that God is still speaking to us through prophets. Yes. And so God's voice is still there yeah. and we're still being guided. And that gives me faith to keep on going. Amen. That's it. Kim, would you like to uh, share anything with us tonight? Um, sure. Let me just clarify. Are, are we reading the letter from a Birmingham jail? Yes. 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 The letter okay. from Birmingham jail so, in conversation with Micah I, chapter six. Okay. So I haven't read Micah chapter six, but I would like to go back to that. And I haven't fully read the letter but what comes to me in as much that I have read is that um, 
um, I can only really speak for myself. And for me, true transformation has come from the Lord when I invited in his Holy Spirit. I also have come to the realization that I have neglected, forgotten, and ignored his Holy Spirit. And I feel this is, this is key. This is important um, to, to wear a mantle for the Lord and what is he calling us. And even if we're not able to go and march and show up there, well, prayers, prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective and they are influential. Um, and we can invite his holy manifest presence here in every detail of this life. Um, so he also had mentioned um, self-purification and not quite sure what he means by that, but I have, I have chosen to allow that to happen within me, my heart, my mind, my will, my intentions, my emotions, every part of me, all that I have, um, just to be able to surrender all because mm -hmm. I have the understanding that uh, this life isn't my own. It belongs mm -hmm. to God and it's for him and it's to glorify him. And, you know, he wants that relationship with all of us. Jesus came once for all. Um, so how do we, how do we do that part? How do I no longer be complacent, turn, turn my face, turn my ear and think that I have nothing to offer or nothing, nothing I could possibly do would make any difference because it's Jesus in each one of us who makes the difference. That's, that's what I have right now. <laughs> Kim, what a beautiful that's confession. A yeah. that, just, that's um, a confession we all need. I just um, want to I just want his right relationship. I just want to learn what that is, who he is, who I am in him and, and what I have in him. It's through him that I'm here for his reason, for his glory. And I just want to keep learning more and more. And I'm so grateful that um, he is a kind and forgiving God. That is a lifelong process and forgiveness Amen. and bitterness. Um, can change he can change that to openness and to relationship the older i'm getting the more i realize Ooh, the deeper i get in with the lord the more he wants me to broaden and and join hands with people and you know become really the church it's outside mm -hmm. of the building it's it's Absolutely. who we are yes. who yeah. he is amen yeah i think that's so it's so important kim my what, what i took away from this because I think that there are there, that we have a tendency to look at things like this, uh, both both what Martin Luther King was going through then and, and now as moments in history instead of movements that are tied to one another. And mm -hmm. I think so often after this tension is gone, because we know that this tension will leave again, we'll all get back to the normal, whatever that is. And I think a lot of times, kind of what we were talking about last week was I get lulled back into thinking, oh, you know, we're done with that. That was like something we did, but you know, we, we we're on the next level. We've passed all that and none of that's going to ever come back again. And um, what Kim said is so important is continually um, giving ourselves into being purified again and being lit again. Because I think sometimes when we think of it as moments, it doesn't get into our muscle memory. We just do it once you know, like when you work out once and you're like, oh, that was, you know, great or whatever, but then you don't do it ever again, your muscles, again, you have to do it over and over and over again until it gets into the core of who you are. You know, people think that, you know, when you have, you pray for the first time, they're like, oh, that wasn't that, you know, nothing too big happened then. But it's what, what happens is when you pray continuously, that's when your core starts to change because it gets into you. It gets into your very fiber of who you are. And so I, my prayer is that I won't think even of this moment in history as a moment, but as a movement that is continuing, that I have to keep on, you know, pushing that boulder up the hill, no matter how many times it comes back down towards me, but to keep on pushing further and further and further. Um, and that, and, and, and just keep it, keep it going and keep it in my muscle memory uh, and keep on giving myself to it. 
and Kim yeah. on that beautiful confession, I will close this tonight on our homework for next week, which okay. is our gospel text. Okay. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. Okay. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Mm -hmm. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So next week we have a gospel text and Micah to consider as we uh, continue in this letter. Uh, I hope this will take us into July at least. We have some other social justice themes in the summer. Caitlin is working on one right now that uh, we'll be inviting our Westminster Presbyterian friends in on. So uh, we look forward to next week. Um, any final word and we'll close in prayer. Lynn. Yes, an announcement, because all of us are here, except for Janelle. I'd like to finish up the Presbyterian Women's Bible Study, um, and I want you to email me or text me, would you like it three Thursday nights in a row, or maybe one in June, one in July, one in August? So same Either time seven. on a Thursday night at seven, yeah. so think about that and let me know as soon as you can. Lynn, either is seven. Yep. You are such a good facilitator. Oh, I am. thank you. Yeah, you're good. You know, either is fine with me, but I retired. So I, you know, I don't keep regular hours. I was going to say, and I'll say it quick. That's hard to believe. Your testimony is very wonderful. And, you know, I had to work through this as a skeptic. Uh, God says in the Bible, or no, I'm sorry, in the original confession I made not in 1948, but 1960, it said, the catechism said, or whatever it was, what is the chief end of men? Well, the chief end of men, I'm sorry, ladies, was to glorify God. Boy, that was a sexist, sexist catechism. But, still you know, th then you have Jesus saying, consider the lilies of the field. Neither do they toil, nor do they weep. But G uh, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, but one of these. So what is the chief end of a lily you know i mean if our end is to love god well the chief end of the lily is to be a lily and mm -hmm. you bring your testimony and yourself to this you're beautiful i mean you're you have a wonderful soul and we share that in fellowship and that's the church you know it's more than a amen. building yeah. amen building. thank you all my <laughs> friends i will see you next time Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good, night. Good to see you all.